Hello, everyone. I'm glad you can attend this week's Attitude Experts webinar. I think today's topic is relevant to all of us, parents raising a child with ADHD or adults living with the condition. We all know how important high quality sleep is for optimizing the brain and managing symptoms. We also know how difficult it is to achieve. Doctors Joel Nigg and Elizabeth Super will discuss the science behind the link between sleep challenges and the ADHD brain. They will also talk about the special, special challenges teens with ADHD face when it comes to sleep, as well as adults. And most importantly, uh, they'll give us strategies and solutions to tackle those sleep challenges. First though, today's webinar sponsor is Sonic Alert, maker of the Sonic Bomb alarm clock. Never sleep past your alarm clock again with this extra loud alarm and powerful bed shaker. The dual alarm clock has been proven to wake up even the heaviest sleepers. If you want more information about that, go to sonicalert.com slash alarm hyphen clocks. Just so you know, Attitude webinar sponsors have no role in the selection of guest speakers, the speaker's presentation, or any other aspect of the webinar production. Now let me introduce Dr. Nig and Dr. Super. Joel is a professor in psychiatry and behavioral neuroscience at Oregon Health and Science University. He's the author of a wonderful book called Getting Ahead of ADHD and a regular contributor to Attitude Magazine. Elizabeth is an associate professor in the Division of Pediatric Pulmonology and Sleep Medicine at Oregon Health and Science University. She has practiced as a board certified sleep medicine specialist since 2009. Before we begin, though, we wanted to conduct a little poll about the reasons why you tuned in to today's webinar. So the, the options are learning about different sleep disorders, behavioral management for sleep problems, medical issues related to sleep, all of the above. So while you're doing that, um, I'd like to mention a few things about our webinar interface. The widgets on your screen are completely resizable and movable. You can submit any questions through the Q&A widget. Joel and Elizabeth will answer as many questions as time allows. One important thing, um, this webinar is streamed through your computer and the internet, so it is bandwidth intensive. For the optimal webinar experience, it's best to close any programs that are running in the background. So now let's see the results of the poll. Um, okay. Um, behavioral management for sleep problems got, oh no, all of the above got the vast majority. Okay, that's interesting. Well, behavioral management will be um, talked about by Joel and Elizabeth later on. I know that in their presentation. So with all that being said, let me turn over the webinar to Joel and Elizabeth now. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Joel Nigg. I'm going to start this off, and then the second half will be uh, Dr. Super. So I first wanted to just summarize uh, kind of the high points we're going to cover today. We are going to, as, as uh, Wayne pointed out, everybody knows sleep is important, but we're still going to highlight a couple of reasons why it's especially important for kids that you may not be aware of just to, to help, and it may help connect the dots for some of what you're seeing with questioning whether sleep and ADHD are related. We're going to talk about the amount of sleep, just kind of the goals that we had just to refresh us on that, and then re review the common sleep problems that are behaviorally related, which many of you are probably all too familiar with, and then some guidelines both for routinely making sleep go more smoothly and then what to do when that doesn't work, and finally, how to know when it's time to go beyond treating this as a behavioral issue and going to a, a formal um, full full on sleep evaluation with a sleep specialist. Most of our talk is going to be about children and teens, but it's only a few changes to this material to make it relevant to adults and we can certainly expand on adults if that's a key question during the Q&A period as well. 
So one uh, thing that has been popular in the media lately is a re-recognition or a re-popularizing um, of the idea that sleep and ADHD are connected. While this has been known about for decades, it's it, every so often becomes a hot topic, and that's true certainly today. We see headlines like this um, where a new study comes out and the question of is ADHD really maybe a sleep problem? And we'll talk about that in a minute, but I always, in all my webinars and, and talks, I caution against any one single theory of ADHD. A reminder, just a reminder to all of us that ADHD has many sources, and it's quite possible that one subgroup is kids with sleep problems, um, but we don't want to oversimplify and, and try to reduce everything down to that. Um, but uh, we don't want to miss a sleep problem when it's uh, involved. So let me say, well, so we're obviously going to go from that now. Here's another um, key headline, and it's the same story. Uh, if sleep is the issue, let's make sure we solve that. And it's important to highlight this because it, it can happen and has happened many times where you will go in for an evaluation for ADHD and the question of sleep simply won't be thought of in the evaluation. And it's a, it's a blind spot sometimes for clinicians uh, in how we train clinicians and and certainly, so certainly um, part of the reason we're doing this webinar is we just think it's important to that sleep not get overlooked. Uh, and that we, we kind of want to validate to some extent this, this um, popularizing it is important not to overlook sleep as a possible hypothesis for the problems. Let's give a little bit of the science on sleep to some headlines from the literature. Uh, as Wayne pointed out, uh, sleep is a challenge for all of us. In fact, the statistics are rather startling that something like 70% of us don't get enough sleep. And um, I think probably if I asked, if, if we could all see each other, we'd all be raising our hands saying we aren't sure we get enough sleep. The second is that in the case of ADHD, it's actually not true that most kids have a biological sleep disorder. Some do, it's a little bit above random chance there, but it's unusual for it actually to be the true uh, root cause, not unheard of but it's not likely from the literature that all the kids with ADHD or even most of them actually have a true biological disorder, although we're gonna talk about those in a little bit. But that said, it is true that it's very, very common. In fact, probably majority of kids with ADHD do have some kind of sleep-related problem. Uh, behaviorally related sleep disruption, this is called, where the sleep problems are secondary to the ADHD. However, they then make it worse, so you get a vicious cycle going. Uh, and that's the key take-home point here. Sleep can interact with ADHD, make it worse, and in turn, ADHD can make sleep worse. I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but first I want to say a little bit about the value of sleep. We already know that if you don't sleep well, you don't have good attention, and we'll show some data on that in a minute. But what's less well appreciated is that how important sleep is for learning. Many of you have probably had the experience of your child with ADHD getting something in school on Monday and having to start all over on Tuesday, not remembering it. And one possibility is that's because they didn't sleep very well. The, one, of the, one of the myths about sleep is that not much happens during sleep. But uh, I first want to go over how much sleep we really need. Now, these numbers that may shock you, um, kids need a lot of sleep. And when you back it up to what we're going to talk about in a minute, to the idea that we really would like to have a good casual, nice, relaxing bedtime routine, the bedtime start times start to be um, something that a lot of us are going to shake our head and say, how can I ever get that to work? I just can't get that going that early. There's too much to do. So this is a challenge for all of us. But it's important to notice kind of what the ideal target would be and then work back from that and think about what, how close can we get, what can we manage. And, of course, one of the challenges for all of us is at school, start, time, start times are early, especially for teens. I'm going to say more about teens in a little bit. So let me come back to this myth that nothing happens during sleep or that sleep's not important. Um, it is important for attention, but it's also important for learning. The reality is that we learn as much, kids learn as much during sleep as they do when they're awake. Sleep is when learning is actually consolidated. Uh, these are just brain imaging studies, uh, uh, and this is just a, this little brain scan. That the, what's interesting about this, it, it illustrates this, this kind of classic study from over a decade ago, is that when kids do brain scans while they're learning something, uh, say uh, some vocabulary words, then when their brain is scanned while they're sleeping, the same activation pattern is happening while they're sleeping. Now it's happening 
during the learning task. What this implies is that the brain is rehearsing the learned material during sleep and storing it. And there's now a large body of research in animals and humans, both in adults and kids, demonstrating that during sleep, material that was learned during the day is consolidated and stored in memory. So part of the function of sleep is to store learning. Going back to that for a minute, there's actually some studies in preschoolers showing that um, preschoolers who took a nap after, after being taught something new learned it better than, than preschoolers who stayed awake and kept practicing it. So there's actually a, an active role for sleep and learning. This is just kind of to, to motivate us, but it's also to help recognize, hmm, if my child isn't remembering what they learned, this may be an additional warning signal to think about sleep. This is just a study uh, that was done very recently. Actually, this was just presented at a meeting I was at two weeks ago by uh, the lead scientist on this paper, just demonstrating the causality. There's been controversy about causality. Is sleep really causing inattention problems or just correlated with it? You've all heard that correlation is not causation. This study actually did randomly assign kids to have their sleep restricted or to have it extended for a week and then got teacher and parent ratings and self ratings. And they did show that by random assignment where you have causality, you can make a causality conclusion that inattention and opposition was worse after reduced sleep and interesting sluggish cognitive tempo symptoms, but not more hyperactivity. So this may be a sign that when you are seeing sluggish, sluggish symptoms, your child doesn't seem very alert or they're especially irritable, that that may be, may be another uh, yellow warning light to think about, are they sleeping adequately? So the, the bottom line here is it's kind of this bi-directional relationship. ADHD symptoms can make sleep worse, poor sleep can make ADHD worse, and there's an entire behavioral dynamic here to think about before we even get to the uh, medical conditions that can drive sleep problems. So let, what are the sleep-related behavior problems? The American Academy of Sleep Medicine actually lists these in their diagnostic uh, manuals and clinicians can identify these as targets for intervention and there are counseling interventions for these and again for many of you these will be all too familiar. Uh, the child won't fall asleep without special hard to achieve criteria or conditions. Uh, sleeping is something the child just doesn't want to do. They don't like going to bed. For some reason they've developed a negative association that they don't like to sleep. Looks like the slide is misbehaving here. Uh, they wake during the night and they won't go back to sleep without you getting up and going in there and doing something. And this becomes a habit that is hard to break. Or there are other kind of problems with setting limits around sleep. The child can't fall asleep or they can't stay asleep or they stall their bedtime or they, they get up during the night and won't go back to bed. So these are the most common problems. And the first line of defense is to see all of this as a behavior as a behavioral issue that can be handled with behavior, just like you would handle other behavioral issues like uh, refusing to eat or not listening or any other behavioral problem that you may have uh, and thinking about as a parent or even with yourself in terms of our own habits that we all have. Um, it's a behavior to start with and how do we approach that behavior? And then we go back and think about the medical side. So I'm gonna do this in two phases first. What are kind of the basics of good sleep hygiene, we call it, just good habits to help sleep go well for kids. And again, as with minor changes, some of the supply, a lot of supplies to adults. And then we'll go on to when that doesn't work, uh, what to do. So first of all, the basics of what's called good sleep hygiene, just good sleep habits or good sleep practices for kids. And the way to think about this is to think about boundaries around sleep. Sleep is a special action that we wanna learn to do and it has boundaries around it on time and around space. The time boundaries are to think in terms of a period of time, 45 minutes to an hour before sleep, when you want some conditions to be positive for sleep. And there are kind of our three big ones here that we wanna remember. One is blue light, that means screens, phones and video games. This blue light uh, can interfere with sleep. I'll say more about that in a second. Heavy food or heavy meal right before bed can make it harder to sleep. And vigorous exercise uh, can make it hard to sleep. This is something that I struggled with. For many years, I loved to go, go to the gym after supper and then I couldn't sleep. And I finally figured out that a lot of exercise in the evening makes it hard for the body to quiet down for sleep. So like an hour break before any hard exercise. And then just generally having a quieting down process for that hour. So thinking about that time boundary around sleep. And the second is a space boundary. 
uh, and again, it's hard to do this for a lot of you. Um, the child's bedroom is the only place where things can happen. There may not be room in the bedroom to do everything, but when possible, the ideal is that the bed at least is only used for sleeping and that if a child is going to play or study in their room that they don't do it on the bed. That's kind of the ideal. And so that way the, the brain is learning that when you're in the bed, you sleep. That's kind of the behavior that the brain associates. It's kind of a, a stimulus response kind of thing that we want the body and the brain to automatically learn. Uh, in the ideal world, if we had unlimited room, we would have the entire bedroom only be for sleeping. But um, I know for a lot of us that that's not realistic because the child needs the bedroom for other activities. But at least if you can, try to aim for only the bed, uh, the bed to be only for sleeping and to do other activities off the bed to the extent you possibly can. So these are the space boundaries and the time boundaries that are our general principles around this. Let me say another word about the blue light. There's actually a physical basis for this. The uh, body has hormone responses that are light dependent. And there's actually a clock in the brain. It's, it's in an area of brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus that responds to light. And this uh, is actually trained in from babies. They, the brain entrains itself to light. And unfortunately, the screens that we use on our computers and in our phones fool the brain into thinking that it's not time to go to bed and the hormone production that's necessary for sleep doesn't happen. So we want to ideally avoid those screens for that hour before it's time to go to bed. Now, there is actually some research that if you filter the light on your phone or on your computer with an orange filter and take away the blue part of the spectrum, that you can avoid this problem, that, that the, the hormone changes that are necessary for sleep will not be disrupted. But, um, and so that you can do that if it's just not possible, uh, but you, you can go that way out. But you really, it's really better to try to just get the screens away for that last hour. And I know we, we could have a whole webinar on, on a screen addiction and the challenge that I know m many of you have with, with your kids, especially your teens, but that's the goal. So what are some action steps here? And I, I go over this in detail. Just a little brief plug for that book that, that Wayne mentioned on getting ahead of ADHD, where I have a whole chapter on this. But uh, just a, kind of some headlines here for key uh, hygiene behaviors. First up is set up a routine, uh, with, which so it's not just sending the child to bed, but having a 30 to 45 minute gradual process here of getting ready for bed. Uh, keep that routine uh, positive. You want to end on a, on a positive note. This gets to the issue of the child sees bedtime as something negative and sees sleep as something negative. And then one of the behavioral challenges that's hard for, for many of us with our kids is helping them keep moving forward. The child wants to stall out, they'll stay in the bathroom too long or they'll get sidetracked. So a little bit of that needing to redirect sometimes, especially if the child has ADHD, uh, keeping them engaged around, okay, now keep on doing the next thing that you're supposed to do, uh, even while they're talking or telling a story or whatever. And then it's nice to end with some kind of positive ritual that the child enjoys. A lot of you are already doing this, maybe telling a story or reading a book, singing a song, saying the prayers, maybe doing a, a memory of the best part of the day. And that can be a little bit of warm, intimate, fun, nice time. But the idea here is to create a really positive association. Again, we want the child's brain to learn that going to bed and sleeping are, some, are where something nice happens and it feels good. That's kind of the learning we want the child to have and try to get out of that experience that sleeping or bedtime is somehow negative or unpleasant. And then ideally you end with the child drowsy and saying good night, but they don't have to be, you don't have to wait till they go asleep. In fact, one danger there is that the child unconsciously learns that they can't fall asleep unless their mom or dad is with them. And we don't want that to be the learning. We want them to learn to fall asleep by themselves. But um, so, so if this is an issue, we can talk about how to solve that. But what you're going to try to shoot for is getting to the point where you can leave the room when they're still awake, but they're ready to fall asleep shortly. All right, a few just additional comments on this that are kind of interesting. Uh, it's important to have this routine be the same. Again, we're talking about building habits here, having this be un automatic and unconscious. Uh, this is not something we want to be a lot of effort. We want it to just kind of be automatic and natural that just kind of happens without a lot of struggle. And that, that's probably making the habit having it be the same so the brain and the, all of us in the brain learns to just, to just how it is as an automatic association. Um, and then when you get into the situation where you've got the child in bed, but then they call you back or they get out of the room, what you want to do is try to avoid rewarding that 
with a big positive interaction and instead try to keep that engagement to the minimum and redirect them. Again, think of it as a behavior. Time to go back to bed. We'll talk about this tomorrow. Um, I've got it. I've got it memorized. We won't forget. Whatever the is you need to say to help them as as promptly as possible move back to the behavior they're supposed to be doing, which is going to sleep. And again, this is not a time for punishment. However, keeping it positive, uh, you know, you, you did a good job getting into bed. Let's let's go back to bed. It's time to sleep. And then we'll talk in a minute about the behavioral plan you'll need to put in place if this isn't enough, but you can again treat this as a behavior and develop uh, additional positive rewards for going promptly back to bed or, or staying in bed. Some parents find it helpful to write out the bedtime schedule. First we're going to brush our teeth, then we're going to change into our pajamas, etc. Then we're going to tell a story uh, and kind of so the child knows what to expect. For very little kids especially this, this is sometimes helpful. It's not something you have to do it may make it harder to do it in some instances, but for some parents, that's been a nice little trick to do. And then occasionally, or, or more than occasionally, if this isn't enough, if just doing this routine, if you're already doing this and it's not working, uh, then it's time to think about, okay, I need to put in more of a structured behavior plan here to get back on track. And maybe I need a little bit of counseling to, to make sure I can do that. So what happens when the routine doesn't work and you've got a problem to solve at the behavioral level? One piece of good news here, there's a couple of studies recently that are very encouraging. Counseling around sleep is extremely effective. It's, it's quite straightforward for professional counselors to troubleshoot what's happening in your sleep routine and to give you um, the tips that you need to fine tune your, your plan for the bedtime. And there's a nice literature now showing that even a couple of counseling sessions with a sleep counselor a behavioral counselor on this and, and can get you back on track. So the good news is this is not something where you need a year of counseling. Often you can get it uh, back on track fairly readily with the right uh, modifications to, to what you're doing behaviorally. And then the principles here in any uh, program are first of all treating going to sleep as a behavior. Don't think of it just as something the body does by itself. Think of it as a behavior that you want the child to learn to do, just like they learn to um, do their table manners or other behaviors. And you can create a behavioral system for it, just like any other behavior where they get points for going to sleep or points for going to bed or, or so on. And then the principle is uh, all of this is going to be somehow fading, fading in toward the behavior you want. It may be too big of a leap to go directly from child is up for an hour every night to straight to staying in bed, but you gradually want to move toward that by by incremental goals and that's what you map in uh, behaviorally and then as you get in with the counselor there's a number of technical methods for doing this here's some of the terms that are used in the counseling literature building towards sleep with positive routines using what's called unmodified extinction that's a fancy phrase for toughing it out <laughs> kind of suffering through the, the uncomfortable period before it's time to fall asleep but there's also kind of these graduated programs where you keep it positive give the child success and build toward incremental goals to where they're getting closer and closer to the kind of sleep routine and sleep quality that we want. And then one of the key challenges is having the child go to sleep by themselves and gradually fading out your presence as a parent during the going to sleep process. And again, that's something you want to do gradually. You don't want to cut cold turkey with your comforting during sleep time. Uh, if the child is needing too much of your time and attention during sleep, you don't want to take that away all at once or it's just painful for the child. Rather, you want to phase it out gradually in a very positive way so that it feels positive every step of the way for the child. And that's where a good counseling can really help to get, get that dialed in uh, very effectively. And there's a number of ways to troubleshoot this when it's not working. And we, we can touch on that a little bit in the Q&A if needed. Um, but often it's very individual specific to what's happening in your particular circumstance. The important point here is that all these different methods are about equally effective. It's, it's not critical that your counselor use one method or another or that you do. You can choose the method that feels right for your parenting style, for your personality, and then um, just target it to the specific problem that you're having, whether that's getting out of bed during the night or not wanting to go to bed or whatever it, it may be. So these are the general principles that the counselor would work with and help you to implement. And again, it can be done fairly readily. These are pretty easy methods for you to implement once they're, they're taught. A couple of tidbits. I'm going to skip by these quickly in the interest of time, but an interesting twist is sometimes a pleasant smell will improve 
uh, sleep and learning as something that you can think about for uh, interesting tips and twists in this. But I want us to be able to move on here now to what to do when none of this works and how to know when it's really time to get a formal sleep evaluation with a sleep specialist. So I'm going to invite Dr. Super to take over here and to step in and uh, walk us through the medical side of this where sometimes it really is a true, is a true medical problem that you have to be able to uh, get addressed. Okay, thanks Dr. Nig. Um, that was that was really great. So so questions kind of when should I get a formal sleep evaluation? Um, and that's what I enjoy doing as a general pediatrician as well as a sleep medicine um, specialist, kind of helping families and children get get more sleep. So when we think about sleep, um, kind of in the most common cause of sleepiness, especially in teens, um, it's actually not a primary medical issue. It's exactly what we were talking about: not enough sleep. And I think as as Dr. Nig mentioned. It is very tough for adolescents to get adequate amount of sleep, which the recommended um, amount or even dose, if we're thinking about how important sleep is for ADHD symptoms, is about nine and a quarter hour sleep. So with early school start times, um, kids having to get up at 6 a.m., potentially getting to bed at 9 a.m., which is very difficult for teens as more physiologically they may be set for their body clock to be later. Um, I like to talk to parents um, about common sleep stealers though and those if you think about your child is sleep deprived during the week um, or even more more times when you're when your child's not getting enough sleep and that can be on weekends when the thought is oh it's Friday night Saturday night why not stay up late really that's a sleep stealer for your for your kids that are already already probably chronically sleep deprived um, if they're spending times at, at different households between parents who are co-parenting making sure that the the sleep routine is similar in both of those houses um, so besides not getting enough sleep, if your child is getting enough sleep and they still have these symptoms, this is a red flag. And the most common primary sleep disorder we see, especially in school age kids, um, between ages even three to eight, is obstructive sleep apnea. Symptoms can be snoring that's persistent, so more than three days per week. So not just when your child's sick, but snoring um, possibly very loudly very routinely. Pauses in breathing, if you're really hearing kind of a, a choking, a, a gasping during sleep with snoring, that is abnormal and you should absolutely be talking to your primary care provider about that. Um, sometimes kids mouth breathe during sleep, they're sweating during sleep because sleep apnea is really a cessation or a stopping of breathing during sleep because of significant obstruction and that obstruction during sleep can cause them to really work hard or sweat during sleep and again the red flag if your school age kid is actually getting 11 12 hours of sleep but they're still sleepy something is not normal and further evaluation potentially for sleep apnea is indicated and I think as we know school age kids if they don't get enough sleep they often are not sleepy they're more hyperactive inattentive have more impulsive behaviors um, for sleep apnea obesity is a significant risk factor so something to think about so so again big red flag warning of sleep apnea snoring pauses in breathing, mouth breathing, or sweating during sleep. So if you have those symptoms, talk to your primary care provider, and a referral to a sleep medicine specialist is definitely indicated. And be beyond that, they may order something called a polysomnogram or an overnight sleep study, which is a non-invasive test. There's no um, radiation, there's no blood draws, but there's simply measurement of brain waves and breathing during sleep at night. And the good news for sleep apnea is if we can find it, we can treat it. Um, and there are are treatments that have been effective for kids for mild sleep apnea could be some allergy medicine some topical nasal steroids um, more invasively could be surgery removing the tonsils if indicated and then a CPAP machine especially if there's um, obesity or, or kids are older so thinking about sleep apnea um, as Dr. Nig said sometimes providers kind of um, forget about asking for about sleep in kids with ADHD and and really thinking about your child if they're snoring during sleep so another red flag another primary sleep disorder is something called restless leg syndrome and this is not something that's occurring during sleep but can be a symptom that's that's contributing to insomnia or difficulty falling asleep and it's it's these symptoms there's no blood test for it but it's a symptom of urge to move the legs worse at times of rest 
And those are a lot of a lot of our kids with ADHD, right? They're hyperactive, they're fidgety kids, but really these symptoms can be worse later in the day that are from restless leg syndromes and they're relieved by movement. Um, so evaluation for restless leg syndrome, um, again, referral to sleep medicine specialist, again, if the symptoms disrupt sleep. So many of our kids are kind of hyperkinetic or moving a lot or fidgeting, and that kind of helps them concentrate. But these are really symptoms of restlessness that are impeding their ability to fall asleep. And the symptoms can be, can be very different. It's also difficult for kids to really relate these symptoms to us. Um, we can use further questioning um, from a qualified sleep medicine specialist or even even uh, validated symptom rating scales. Um, and again, the good news with this, if we diagnose restless leg syndrome, there are some adequate treatments that can help kids be less restless at night. And there's been a big correlation between iron storage levels and restless leg syndrome. I think there's more research coming out around iron storage and also ADHD. So we would measure the iron storage levels. We'd possibly get a sleep study to see if these leg movements are occurring during sleep. Um, and then we really try to target the symptoms with non-medication as well, potentially heating pads, relaxation devices, and if there's low iron levels, we can supplement that. So thinking about symptoms prior to sleep that may be contributing not only to the behavior um, insomnia that Dr. Nick talked about, but actually restlessness. Um, how about our teenagers um, who have very, very extreme insomnia? There's um, a condition, this is a circadian condition called delayed sleep phase syndrome. And these are patients that are extreme night owls. And so extreme, they may have difficulties falling asleep prior to 1 to 3 a.m. Well, these may be as, as um, maybe these adolescents grow up, these may be the great um, people that are working night shift or swing shift, and it's not really affecting their daytime life. But uh, unfortunately for adolescents, they have significant daytime dysfunction because school starts at 6 or 7 a.m., which actually is in the middle of their sleep cycle. So imagine someone trying to wake you up at 2 or 3 in the morning, how you may be functioning at that time. Really hard to wake up. You may miss work, or in this case, kids may miss school, there's mood difficulties, and academic decline. So again, they're asking to be um, performing and cognitively alert, maybe in the middle of their sleep cycle. Um, so they have difficulties if they're needing to wake prior to 10 a.m. If the children or adolescents are able to be on their own schedule, let's say sleeping 1 a.m. to 10 a.m., there's no primary sleep dysfunction. They wake up rested, they're functioning well, but if they're not on their desired schedule, they have these significant dysfunctions. So this is delayed sleep phase syndrome. It's a circadian-based disorder where we know that their um, circadian rhythm is delayed or later, and because of this, they have significant difficulties um, functioning. So these kids are the ones who really do well in the summer. They're, they set their own schedule, they sleep well, they're productive, but maybe behavioral behavior is um, going well, um, but during the school year there's a lot of disruption. So evaluation for this, kind of thinking about is it a circadian-based rhythm disorder or is it some of the sleep hygiene issues that Dr. Nick talked about? We want to make sure that teens aren't just um, delaying sleep because they're exposing them themselves to media, they're very active prior to sleep, let's say they have sports very soon before their, their sleep time, they're staying up to socialize, there's excessive homework. We really want to understand um, their sleep pattern and we can fill out further sleep diaries or even do recordings of sleep. This is an act to watch that's a validated motion sensor for sleep. It's not um, a Fitbit, which there's many, many, many um, commercial devices out there that may say that they measure sleep. They really may measure motion during sleep, and we know that sleep is an active motion. Um, it's an active process. So really, if we want to have a marker for sleep, um, we recommend that you do see a sleep medicine specialist and, and use a device that's actually validated to record sleep. For patients with delayed sleep phase, we still have to maximize this healthy sleep hygiene. We have to have routine sleep scheduling. Um, and occasionally then we will kind of um, have a therapeutic, a treatment, um, 
um, that slowly moves the bedtime earlier with use of low dose melatonin and some early morning light. This is quite difficult for both teens and families, but I want you to be aware that it's not just lazy teenagers that maybe can't go to sleep, um, that they may have a real biologic or circadian-based reason why they're having trouble sleeping or even waking up in the morning, which is what we really have the most difficulty with. So how about medications? Um, I wish there were medications that would be an easy fix for all of our kids' sleep and our teens' sleep, but really there are no FDA-approved medications for sleep in children or teens. So any medications that you're using, whether it's over-the-counter, um, like Benadryl, Tylenol PM, or if it's supplements like melatonin, none of them have reached the level where they're FDA approved um, for sleep in children or teens. Even if your provider is prescribing something for sleep, again, it's considered kind of off-label. There is evidence to support melatonin use in children with ADHD, but there's few long-term studies. So it's, it's something that we want to study more, but we just don't know. Patients who maybe have been using melatonin for five or ten years, there may be side effects that we just don't know about. So I always caution parents if they come in to see me, what happens when you don't take the melatonin? Do you really need to take the melatonin? How long have you been taking it? What dose are you taking it at? What time are you taking it at? And what preparation is it? Because it's, it's a supplement, and again, there's no um, reassurance that what it says on on the bottle is what you're actually taking. And that's a supplement for, for kids throughout development that have very vulnerable brains. So I just want to caution um, the, the kind of casual use of melatonin. That being said, we're trying to study it more. And in certain patients with correct use, it has been helpful, especially in kids with ADHD. Some of the ADHD medications can make sleep worse. So stimulants that are that have been shown to be very helpful for ADHD sometimes can make sleep worse. So this is this is a conversation that you need to have with your provider to kind of think about what time are you taking your stimulants? How long are the stimulants lasting? When are they kind of starting to wear off? Is it making sleep worse? We also know that some stimulants can can improve sleep in patients with ADHD. So really talking to your healthcare provider is super important. Um, so just want to close, we kind of talked about the primary sleep disorders and things that you may want to kind of think about with red flags. That was obstructive sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, and, and delayed sleep phase syndrome. Um, but overall, our take-home message is, is youth with ADHD do have sleep problems that can make it worse, and it's really that bi-directional relationship. Occasionally, a real sleep disorder can cause apparent ADHD, but most of the time, and that's not it. Like Dr. Nick said, it's very complicated. We don't want to simplify things. And we really want you or your child to get the, bo the most individualized care. That's the most important thing is for someone to really work with you individually. Um, first line approach to sleep problems is really behavioral sleep management. We have lots of evidence for that. Um, and to consider primary sleep disorders in children and teenagers presenting with ADHD with primary inattention. Um, last resort is medical intervention after a primary sleep evaluation. All right, well that that's concludes kind of the end of our of our slides. Okay. And yeah, we put um, a couple I'll of we did put a, we did put a couple of resources here just to flag um, the, at the website. Um, a couple of websites are up there with more resources for those that want them. Okay. Well, um, lots of people asking about adults with ADHD and sleep challenges. Is there anything you can add to that to, to help, help the many people who have asked that? I mean, the amount of time they should get in terms of sleep and um, are the challenges for the teens and the kids the same for the adults? and can you do any um, a short? Yeah, yeah, I can do a quick. I'll, I'll do a quick. I'll do a quick comment, and I think Dr. Super might make a quick comment too. First of all, yes, uh, a lot of the same uh, issues hold for adults, and certainly for some adults, a big challenge is getting yourself to actually do these behaviors that you know you should do, but they're hard to do. So actually, getting yourself to bed on time, getting yourself up at the same time every day. So certainly for adults with ADHD, the first line of defense is to try to get those sleep hygiene practices going. Get your bedroom quiet and dark, only use it for sleep um, or, or uh, sleep or sex, obviously, in the case of adults. Um, <clears throat> go to bed at the same time every night, get up at the same time every day, even if you don't think you slept well. Uh, avoid exercise and heavy meals and avoid your screens. 
in that hour before bedtime, hard for all of us because we have so much to keep track of on our screens. And if you really feel like you, sl you slept all night and still are tired, get that evaluation for a possible primary sleep disorder, consult your physician. But I think for adults with ADHD, the biggest challenge is that if I'm an adult with ADHD, it's just hard to discipline myself to do the things I want to do, uh, the willpower, and that's really the big challenge is how to motivate myself to do it. And think about how to reward yourself with uh, something really positive in the morning that makes you want to go to bed or something really positive at night that makes you want to go to bed so that you can get yourself to bed and get yourself up. It can be helpful mm -hmm. to have these a light alarm. A light alarm helps you wake up. So there are, are alarms now that will turn a bright full spectrum light on at the time you set and do it gradually. That may make waking up help your hormone function uh, get back on track a little bit with the early morning that you have to get up. So that's kind of the general principle. But yes, a lot of this will apply to adults the same. And the only challenge is you don't, you don't have a parent to help you. You got to do it yourself. And that's, that's a big challenge. And there's also, mm -hmm. of course, the, the challenge for uh, adults who are married or in a partnership or a relationship where your partner might not have the same sleep schedule you do. And that becomes a difficult uh, negotiation as well, of course. Let me just give a second in case Dr. Super wants to comment. And then I know you've got a lot of other questions for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that was great, Dr. Nick. I think um, this, the medication story is similar in adults as children. And the first line treatment based on good research now is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia in adults. It is not medication. And I think that is that is so hard because it's easier to think you can take a pill than to change your behavior. So I just want to reinforce that and also put a plug in similar to what Dr. Nick said is that cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia in adults is effective. It can work and it may not take very much time. It may meet maybe a three to four three to four sessions of behavioral therapy for adults as well. So these these are hard things to change and I think more and more we're learning that medication is not the answer. Mm -hmm. A couple of general questions. Um, what is why are so many people with ADHD struggling with sleep? Is there some link uh, that science or research has indicated or suggested that that an inordinate amount of people with ADHD, kids and adults, have problems with sleep? It's certainly true that it's a high percentage. There's no question about it. And uh, a, a lot of this is because of the symptoms of ADHD exacerbate all the things that make sleep hard for all of us. It's naturally hard to sleep in our culture because we're so busy. We have so much going on. We're so overstimulated. We have media. We have to get up for school and for work. It's very hard to get that kind of relaxed pace that facilitates natural sleep. We have artificial light. We have artificial noise. And for ADHD, it's all doubled down because if you have ADHD, you're, you're hypersensitive to these environmental stimuli. You're more sensitive to all these inputs. Your body reacts more strongly to stimulation. You're more hyper aroused by things that happen during the day. It's harder to turn your brain off. So all these features of ADHD around regulating our mental state that are so hard with ADHD just makes all these challenges in our society kind of doubles the, the challenge. And so I think it's just a natural side effect of what ADHD is that something like sleep that kind of requires the opposite energy of, of the energy that ADHD provokes mm -hmm. is naturally difficult. And that's why it takes a kind of deliberate attention, a deliberate behavioral strategy or deliberate kind of tackling of this so often for those with ADHD Whereas for those who are lucky enough not to have these issues, it just kind of is automatic for sleep and they don't know how lucky they are compared to those who struggle mm -hmm. with sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, does a lack of sleep interfere, uh, for instance, with uh, neurotransmitters in the brain? Do we know that yet? It's certainly true that if you don't sleep, it's gonna change hormone functioning and that's gonna have uh, downstream effects on neurotransmitters. But uh, other than knowing that sleep affects attention, I don't know that there's a big um, story there. I'm going to let Dr. Super see if she wants to comment. Mm -hmm. No, she was just saying her, her batteries are going bad. <laughs> so, so oh. uh, no, it's going to affect sleep. But I think the story of how that might relate to ADHD symptoms, for example, does poor sleep change your dopamine functioning? I think that's all still being developed, but it's certainly the case okay. that the sleep hormones are going to interact in some form there. Serotonin, for example, is a big one for ADHD and sleep. So I think that story is going to unfold. Mm -hmm. what, what is a, um, a lot of people have asked, what is a typical CBT session in adults? 
uh, for, for getting more sleep. How, how does that work? Could you walk us through what a therapist might do with, with his, uh, his or her client? Uh, a, a typical CBT session um, for sleep um, in adults would be, yeah. um, okay, I'm just going to, she's just plugging into a different outlet. Sorry for the disruption here okay. for us. But That's in a typical right. session for CBT, what you would do, first of all, you would outline the behavioral goal. What is it you want to try to do, the first challenge? So maybe the first challenge is I just can't get myself to bed on time. You know, I know I have to go to bed early if I'm going to get up early and get enough sleep, but I just can't get myself to do it. So in the cognitive behavioral therapy, you're going to work on two things. First of all, making sure that goal is really well defined. Okay, our, let's make specific, specific. What time do you want to go to bed? I want to be uh, in bed by nine because I know I got to get up at five. Okay, that means what time do you want to start cooling down your day, winding down your day? Okay, that means you got to turn everything off at eight. You got to start dimming the lights at eight, turning off the media at eight. Okay, now my problem is I can't get myself to do it. Okay, let's talk about the thoughts you're having that keep you from doing that. What thoughts are you having? And then you start to examine, well, I just don't believe I can need to do it or I just don't feel like I can afford to stop working. And you start to examine and challenge those thought patterns so that you get yourself motivated. And it's kind of then a, a process of teaching yourself to talk yourself down from those false beliefs that keep you from taking this, this positive step for yourself. And then that'll kind of iterate through the obstacles until you've nailed all of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions about products. Do those blue light glasses, are they effective? And another bunch of questions about weighted blankets. Do you have any research or thoughts or opinions on that? Yeah, the the um, blue light glasses or blue light screens that filter out the blue light can be effective. Um, there is a there is a little research showing that if you can get the light to be the orange spectrum or not the blue spectrum, that it will alter the the hormone functioning that's disrupted by blue light. Uh, the the challenge there is it's not as effective as not having any light at all. The, uh, it's only partially effective. And then, um, uh, can you repeat the second part of the question, Wayne? Uh, the weighted blankets. blankets? Yeah, the weighted blankets for kids do help some kids and adults to, to sleep. Um, there's a little bit of research, but it's very preliminary. So certainly anecdotally, a lot of people have had that experience that a weighted blanket can somehow uh, mm -hmm. comfort a child. And, and for very young children especially, uh, in particular cases, it's, it's very um, calming. Uh, so there, are, there is a little bit of work on that. I think it's it's valid to consider that. I'm going to give it to uh, Dr. Super to say more about the the glasses. Okay. Yeah, I just um, I just wanted to mention with media, it's 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 the light exposure which is which is significant. We know is physiologic, as Dr. Um, Nick said, the light goes through to our retina, um, into our pineal gland, and and actually physiologically decreases our melatonin. So if you're giving your child supplemental melatonin, which we have no idea really the doses and how it's going to affect them long term, by using media, you are actually physiologically decreasing their own endogenous or their own body's melatonin. What's been interesting too is kind of something that we know that media is actually stimulating too. So they've done studies now um, it's been adults who were exposed to kind of some internet content or similar Facebook content prior to sleep. And it was not just the light exposure. Um, it's not just the light exposure, but it's the stimulation of the media content. And I think that's super important to know is that you may think about, okay, blocking the blue light for your, for your children in the screens, but the content is still significantly stimulating and that's blocking their ability to, to start sleep and relax into sleep. So when parents ask me, do blue light glasses work? They may work for that one piece of the problem, but they're not going to help the body and the brain really relax relax and start sleep. So I really try to avoid them. I really try to work on what can we do as a family? What are some of the behavioral interventions we can do to get the screens out of the bedroom to model this as parents? So as parents, we also need to say, hey, I'm not bringing my phone into the bedroom. We're all charging our media in one place in the kitchen. That's how we're going to be healthy during sleep. It's really not that the child's in trouble or it's a punishment, but how are we going to get you healthy? How are we going to get you functioning the best um, during school? I talk to my athletes about increased sleep can help their athletic performance. It can help your mood. It can only help your functioning. So 
I really don't like to recommend blue light glasses. I the the case that I do recommend it is is adults who are shift workers and they're coming home, they're driving back home um, in the morning and they're being exposed to all that natural sunlight. Use of blue blockers at that time has shown to be effective to help their body produce melatonin at a time that it's not going to usually. So I'm gonna pass it on. Mm -hmm. What about uh, for adults? I would imagine the same thing applies in terms of the stimulation level. Uh, of a lot of asked, what about reading before bed? A lot of adults have experienced, um, you know, as they read, they fall asleep. So the same thing sort of applies. Make sure that the material you're reading is not too stimulating. Yeah, the, the same question for adults, is it just too stimulating to be uh, using stuff before bed? Uh, yeah, the same principle applies. And the question about reading before bed, uh, I think is very relevant. Sometimes reading is very relaxing. It takes your mind off of your day and it helps you to relax. But I think as was in, implied by the question, if what you're reading is getting you super stimulated, super aroused, super excited, super angry, you know, right before bed may not be the time to read that that blog with the inflammatory political commentary that's making your blood boil. Um, and it, but it may be a time to read, read an enjoyable escapist book that may help you relax a little bit. But again, I would recommend don't read in the bed. Uh, pe people like to read in the bed, but you want the bed to be for sleep. So think about reading in a chair next to the bed or reading right outside the bedroom and then getting into bed when you're feeling drowsy. Uh, right. And that's kind of the trick there. Right. What, uh, do all of these recommendations apply equally to um, kids and adults diagnosed with inattentive ADHD uh, as well as hyperactive um, ADHD? Are there any differences or distinctions or additions you'd like to make Does Not it depend on the diagnosis? Essentially not. I think, I think that if the child has inattentive ADHD or hyperactive ADHD, the, the recommendations are going to stay largely the same. The difference will be in the details. The, the particular behaviors that are interfering with sleep may be different depending on the pattern. So the inattentive ADHD kid may be having trouble following through on their routine. They may be doodling around so long in the bathroom that you can't get them moving forward because they're not focusing. Whereas with the hyperactive kid, it may be that they you know, are jumping back out of bed for something they just thought of. So the specific behaviors may be different that you have to address, but the general principles of getting that behavior program working are gonna be the same uh, across mm -hmm. the board. Uh, I will say though that uh, it's interesting in that, in that adolescent study we cited that uh, poor sleep provoked worse attention, more inattention, but not more hyperactivity. So I think really, the, mm -hmm. as far as the warning signs go, the one caution is when, when inattention and irritability are much more prominent rather than hyperactivity, that's an additional uh, flag that uh, have we ruled out sleep problems. But that's about the only difference mm -hmm. I would make. Uh -huh. In terms of um, sleep apnea, the connection or link between sleep apnea and ADHD, um, several people have said, well, one year I was diagnosed with sleep apnea, and the next year I was, uh, you know, diagnosed with ADHD. I know you might have. They want to know the correlation, if there is any. Okay. Okay. So the question was kind of, is there, you know, what is the correlation between ADHD and sleep apnea? Mm -hmm. um, what we see is that symptoms of sleep apnea can mimic similar symptoms um, of ADHD. So patients with sleep apnea, because their sleep is disrupted, can have hyperactivity, inattention, impulsivity, especially in that school age group. So the converse of that is you could have both sleep apnea and ADHD. I think um, what's really important is if you have symptoms of sleep apnea, that that be evaluated and be treated. And sometimes in my patients, if they have those significant, if they have diagnosed ADHD or more significant symptoms, I am more aggressive um, in treating uh, the sleep apnea. So in some patients, if their sleep apnea is treated, their symptoms of hyper hyperactivity, inattention, impulsivity, they may completely resolve. They may actually no longer have ADHD or their symptoms may improve. So it's really a case-by-case -case, um, um, kind of understanding of what's going on with the sleep and the, and the sleep apnea. Um, 
I often, mm -hmm. you know, if you have symptoms of both, some pediatricians want to have a sleep evaluation first before treating symptoms of ADHD. And that, that can get a little bit tricky. Um, but I just encourage you to think about this is all pieces of a puzzle. And so one piece of the puzzle may actually be sleep apnea. We can get that treated and hopefully the child will be functioning um, better after treatment. What, the, what they found, and there's been pretty good studies, is that... Um, especially in some some children again treatment of sleep apnea may have may have a good resolution of ADHD symptoms or complete resolution but it it really is a case by case um kind of intervention um again just kind of thinking overall that sleep is so important in kind of functioning for kids mm -hmm. and adults yeah, several yeah yes yes several adults have uh, brought up the fact that um they have some real problems in terms of that, that the stimulant, while it helps them manage symptoms, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. they're going back and forth a lot with their practitioner about mm -hmm. dosages or, or mm -hmm. when, I mean, that can be a complex problem, right? It might yeah. take some conversation. Absolutely. Lots of, yeah. So um, the benefit of stimulants versus the side effects. And so seeing your provider, knowing that, hey, stimulants are, are short acting, you're going to kind of know how you're reacting to stimulants in one or two weeks. It's not something you should wait on. And if you're having um, side effects, sleep side effects, that's something you need to go back to your provider because there are different stimulant preparations. There's different stimulant types. There's stimulants that are short acting or long acting. So really talking with your provider and not suffering with that is something that you should, that you should really do and advocate for. Mm -hmm. Does the patch come in in terms of uh, being helpful in this, in terms of being able to take it off? And Yeah, I think, being... again, that's another it's another tool mm -hmm. in our toolbox um, is a, a patch okay. that can have kind of yeah. some long, um, more um, long acting medication for kids. And that's something that may be used. So again, talking to your provider, it's, it can be an option. It can be beneficial. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to okay. pass it on to, to Dr. Nig. Okay. Joel, do you have more to add? No, go ahead. I'm good on that one. Oh, okay. Because the hour is about up, so I have to apologize. Uh, everyone had lots of great, lots of, I, I don't know if it's possible if I could sort of corral a few of these questions and send them your way and we can put them on our website. Uh, sure. Just Let's... a handful. Sure. Okay. I mean, it, it doesn't fine. have to be, it, you know, when you have the time to answer them. But I, but I would, people have had so many great questions. I just want to make sure at least we make an attempt to answer them five or ten most common, that's all. Absolutely. Um, okay, great. So we'll have to have you back again. This is great. I mean, uh, and there was so much material to cover. Uh, so maybe we'll try to go a little more narrow next time. But this Yeah, is we great. can do it over, maybe, over it. maybe do a double header, but uh, it's been a pleasure. So thank you for having us. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for being here, Joel and Elizabeth, and uh, sharing your expertise. Really Our pleasure. Really appreciate it. Our pleasure. Great. Thank you. Uh, once again, today's webinar sponsor is Sonic Alert, maker of the Sonic Alarm, alarm Clock. Um, never sleep past your alarm clock again with this extra loud alarm and powerful bed shaker. Uh, the dual alarm clock has been proven to wake up even the heaviest sleepers. If you want more information about it, uh, the URL is sonicalert.com slash alarm hyphen clocks. On December 5th, which is next week, parenting expert Kirk Martin will talk about how to communicate and connect with a child who tunes you out and doesn't want to talk with you. So see you then, and have a great day, everyone.